let's pray real quick and see what kind of trouble we get into. Fresh Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for the weather, for the, for the beautiful wind, the blue skies, the cool weather, all the things that some of us strongly desire. We thank you for the fact that we can come here and study your word. And we have tutelage from the Holy Spirit at all times with what with the pleasant idea of Him being able to teach us things that will be beneficial to us as we leave this room and, and go out into the world that is not exactly the best <coughs> environment for a Christian. But above all, we thank You for the fact that we can have the information, we can have a church that will allow us to teach the information, and then, and then if we have the desire to come and learn. And for the ones that aren't here, Lord, we lift them to You. We pray that You watch over them take care of them, get them back to us safely, whatever they might be doing. For the ones that are on that list going around, Lord, that might have some kind of medical situation going on, we continually lift them to You as the great physician, allowing us to put that burden on You and not carry such a heavy one ourselves. And then we give You the honor and glory for whatever the results are. And as the people go across the street today, Lord, to hear a message, that they would do so with a heart that is open to listening, the Holy Spirit has a set of ears over there that are desirous to hear and that people would come to a saving knowledge of you. We ask these things in Christ's precious name. Okay. Alrighty then. Now, last week we got just about to the end of the back page of 17, did we not? Does that sound relatively close? Put this up. Because I think we were in that neighborhood. Yeah, page 45 or 46? 45? 46 is 18. Is the beginning of 18? Is that, is that what we got to? Good enough for me. That's all right. Our transcriber wasn't here. She said she was she was she was out. She was on a heathen trip. I mean she was a hell trip. <laughs> so yeah, I think we got we took care of all this by means of faith. We did all of that. Now, all right, now what you've got going on here from this point on is... Uh, Bob, oh, do you have any more papers? Uh, yeah. The next section starts I got a couple. 46. How many people don't have? Everybody should have the whole shooting match, except for people that aren't here. Yeah, this is the next. This this is the next old bat. Okay, got one. All right. Oh. Hey. That, uh, you got it. Yeah. Okay. That match starts with what page? It should start with page 46 on your notes. I gave you all of them at one time. Yes. You got yours. Yeah, that's first one you got. It's there somewhere. Flip it back. You didn't? Sorry, Bob. I'm sure going to grab you by the top there. Yeah. So you're starting with right. I'll get some more if you need some more. I just, I don't, you know, put them all in a notebook. That way you got the whole shoot match. Because the next time we do this, you're going to get all of chapter two. Page. Okay? <laughs> just, just so you know. I see. All right. Yeah. Get this one over here. I'm going to read 11 through 17 because you're going to come to a gigantic transition. <laughs> Now this is from 11 to 17. Just get ready. We already know what the first part is. It's just a greeting. So it says in 11, For I long to see you that I may impart to you some spiritual gift. I already know right off the sh out of the shoot max that's not he's not imparting a spiritual gift. He is teaching from his spiritual gift. Alright? This is why I say words and order make a big difference. So, he's teaching them what he has been given. He is imparting to them what is from his gift, that is doctrine and knowledge that he received in the desert. Alright? So that you may be established, rooted, 
stuck in the ground deeper than you are right now. That is, that I may be encouraged together with you by the mutual faith, both of you and me. That is equality across the table for somebody that's in Jesus Christ. It doesn't elevate Paul. It does not subjugate the people that he's teaching. All right? Now, I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that I have often planned to come to you, but was hindered until now. We covered that. That I might have some fruit among you, just as among other Gentiles. I am a debtor to both Greek and to barbarians. We covered that. Both to wise and to unwise. All right? He does not ever call anybody stupid. You are unlearned. You, are, you may be on the edge of ignorant, but you are not unteachable. Nobody is. Paul never, ever, ever had a problem with anybody he encountered presenting the gospel to them because of IQ. Alright? <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> so, as much as in me, I am ready to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome also. 16. For I am not ashamed of it or the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God to the salvation of everyone who believes. For the Jew first, always the Jew first, until when? Christ came. Until he. It, that would be nice. Until he ascended. Until he ascended, yes. You can give it that. You can go that far along. Okay? Because when he said that, when he told the disciples in the upper room and, other, and along the way, I want you to do me a favor. I want you to stop putting preeminence on the kingdom of God and put it on the kingdom of heaven, which is eternity. Then you had, that was the division. Nation Israel decided they didn't want him. And he was going on to something new. So that's what it talks about. On page 4, you have Christ crossed out. Why? Because that is not in the original Greek. Okay. okay? And I don't want you to have something that is not. Because you have to understand, what is the Gospel? Good news. Christ's reconciliation. Okay. It's redundancy. The Gospel can be about anything but Christ. Okay? Anybody that adds anything to the Gospel, run like that because they are going to jerk you down a rabbit hole that you are never going to get out of. That being said and being true still would it be that much more redundant to say that Christ is the epitome of that? Well yeah, sure. You can say if you you know what you can say? You can say Christ. And anybody with any any brain power at all does not in, in natural form has no ability to take that to the gospel. All they do is take that to a prophet or to a person or to a son or to a, a, a special guy. They do not have the ability to take that particular word. That's why they use the word gospel. Because that word, when you tell somebody, how many of you go down the road and you see something called the full gospel church? Yep. Have you ever studied to see what a full gospel church is? I mean, to me, that automatically makes me think, well, there must be somebody out there doing half Gospels. Or the quarter Gospel. And then you got the fifth, third bank. What in the name of Sam Hill is that? Okay? So you understand what all this stuff is out there, but we now know that the Gospel can't be but one thing. So if any church has that word out there, you go to that church and you don't hear that being preached, you know that they're not telling you the truth on the sign. But yes, you can use the word Christ, but it has to have caveats. I can say Christ to you and it means something. I can say Christ to somebody in the world that does not have Him, and it means something entirely different. I understand what you're saying. People are focusing more on the physical Christ part of it. Correct. Other than, than Christ being... And Christ did not come for the physical. He came for the spiritual. He's the epitome of the Gospel. Correct. I mean, He is the Gospel, if you want to put it that way, but the, all, of the, all of His actions as the Christ or what brought you to the point that you could read something and say this is the gospel. As you were talking about ignorance a moment ago, it struck me that 
Paul was not up against as many atheists as we are. Mm -hmm. Exactly. There were a lot of, their society believed in everything. I mean, atheists. yeah, correct. I mean, they were zealots to the max in everything they did. But talking of, speaking of ignorance, uh, brings to mind uh, you know, that the uh, verse which talks about how uh, they were professing to be wise uh, they were as fools. Yes, and that's, exactly. That's the epitome of uh, the atheist uh, philosophy. Yes, exactly. But there's there's what you have with any zealot. Okay? Because there is nothing to be... How, did, how, how are you to be a zealot for Christ? Are you to be offensive? Are you to be in somebody's face? Are you supposed to hold your nose up just a hair higher than the guy next to you because he he might have memorized a couple more verses than you, or vice versa? You see what I'm saying? So this is what you got here. I have I have zealotry in my heart for Christ. It's internal. It causes me to study more. Causes me to do more off the off the road studying. That's why you get these little papers off to the side from something I've read. It's all beneficial to Christ, not beneficial to me. And that's what Paul's trying to tell them. I've got stuff I need to tell you. It is blowing me up not to tell you. Okay? That's exactly, that's all he's trying to get across to these folks. So that's where you're at. Now, and it says, is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed, okay, from faith to faith. Now, we already talked about that at the front side of that verse. You have to go from pistis to pistuo. You go from faith that is salvation to faith that is a doctrinal intake. Once you get saved, there's a trigger mechanism in you. Holy Spirit goes, click. Now, all of a sudden in her, not only is she going to have an eternal life, she also now has a drive mechanism that makes her want to pick that book up. And to study that book. And to get the nuances of that book. And to put that book into, into here so that she can put that book into her kids. That is, that is not natural. At all. Okay? So that's what they're talking about here. As it is written, the just, these are people that are living under God's system, alright, says right here, shall live by faith. You've adjusted yourself to, to God, to the system protocol, and now you're going to have an instrument in you called faith, and it's going to cause you to do things that this world will call bizarre. Okay? And when you're called bizarre, you should put it on as a badge of acknowledgement. Okay? Because that's exactly what you are. You, you, you're showing characteristics that are not normally observable in people in the world. All right? Now, he has just told you everything that is beneficial in the righteousness of God. He has laid out a pattern here. He said, you are going to be this way. This is what I put out there. Now I'm going to tell you in the transition verse what's going to happen to you, okay, if you never met me and never came to me. All right? So that's where you're at with the next part of this. And I'll read 18 in a second, but I want you to take that paper that you got. If I can find mine. Yes. Everybody got one of these? Except for mine has the corner missing. I put it back in for yours. All right. I'm sorry, I didn't get them on the table quick enough for an hour about it. Bob Lamb? No. Oh, that's the verse. That's the verse from last week. It's this one right here. Kathy will come around and get to it right now. All right. Need some over there too, Miss Dan. She so much. Oh, he's got his hand up too. He wants right his own. Here. 
<laughs> she doesn't. She doesn't share real well. Oh, never mind. She already took it. That's fine. We share. Anybody else? Put some tiki and stacky of stuff on there. All right. Everybody. Everybody good now? All right. Now I put it on paper so that you got it. You can stick it in your in your little book there before verse 18 because this is what's taking place. God's got a protocol system. Talked about it forever. Do it His way or it's not done at all. Alright? I don't care whether you like it. I don't care whether you do it. But He's telling you this is how it's done. If you want me to be part of your life, you're going to do it my way. Alright? And, and that's why He puts it here. In 17, you've got various phases of the revelation of righteousness of God. All through the previous handful of verses. 15, 16, 17. They're all dealing with the same thing. You've got righteousness being put in front of you. And it says, by the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ came, inserted the righteousness. You accept Christ. Now you have the righteousness. You're on a one page of something. There's going to be another page of something coming up in verse 18 that tells you everybody else is going to be in a different category than you. Your job is to find those people that the Holy Spirit marks out for you to intersect with those people Give them the gospel. And when you give them the gospel, they will make a transition to in the will of the Lord and they will become one of us. And I don't mean that cultishly. I mean that you are now one of the body once you've stepped into Christ. Alright? You know, just so it's not anything weird. And then you go down to the next part. It says Romans 1.18. Now he's going to start changing this tone of, tone of what's being said. And he says, now the wrath of God, revelation by gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Same people, other side of the paper. The biggest problem we have nowadays is everybody and their ever-loving uncle is going around peddling this. to the exclusion of the other side of the page. Okay? Now, what this does is it lulls people into a false sense of security because it doesn't tell you any consequences of anything outside of that love. And they don't have, uh, they just don't do it. Now, Paul has a mission. And he, and he, and he talks about it in Acts 20, 27. Don't have to go there, but I just want you to know. It's stated there. And he gives you an introduction as to why he's here, what his job is, who his ministry is going to be to, and all of those little scenarios that lay it out. And then and he says, talks about the announcement of gospel is, is, is something that he says, here's what's going to be peddled by me at all at all phases of my life. And if you go back in your notes, you'll see that, that he has a a program or in his head that always says Christ, church, world, after. That's the way he lays things out. Alright? Now, <clears throat> it starts with right now where you're at on 18 and for the next 63 verses you're going to have a program put onto you and put in front of you that's going to tell you over and over and over and over and over the consequences of not accepting an adjustment to the righteousness of God. This is the kind of stuff that you can tell people. And you're not telling them they're sinning. That never has to enter into the picture at all. All you have to do is say, there's a God that is separated from you. You sometimes acknowledge Him with some things you do or say. I would like to tell you how to get on the same page as this God, and Christ is the great vehicle whereby you can get there. And that's what they're doing here. And he lays it out again and again, Paul does, as a, even, even heaven's laid out that way, as a trial scenario. Prosecution, defense, yada, 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 judge, tribunal, all of that. Why do you think they call Christ our advocate? Where is he standing when he is advocating for us? 
Okay, and where's the Father generally hanging out? It's in the temple. You know what the temple is called? The high court. Okay. <laughs> so all of these things start flowing together when you see how, how the Lord puts things together. Why do you think He has something called the law of establishment? The law of physics. The law of... Laws everywhere. Okay. I mean, there's a law that says you should be married. Or you can't marry your cow. Not anymore. Well, I know. <laughs> but it was working there for a while, all right? So all I'm saying is with all of this, this is what you've got going. Now, here it is. God's line of reasoning. I just laid it out. Man, the creature of God, has a history of sin and a present condition of hopelessness. These are just opening statements by God. He uses these opening statements all along in the Bible. You'll see them. You'll see Christ lay out the same thing. And then the cross is going to be a culmination of this program. Alright? The next part of it says, and this is what chapter 2 is going to wrestle with. Before there can be a remedy, okay, can't come up with a verdict until you got stuff laid out. There must be a diagnosis. There must be a case history. Alright? Which is what you and I are, really. How many of you have a... Uh, my wife does a, a genealogy thing. What is she tracing? Family history. Family, Family history. Family history. Okay? You gotta have it. <laughs> if you don't have it, there are times in your life where you're going to flounder because you don't have anything to relate to. You don't know why something could have happened. Alright? Same deal here. Now, and it says, first part of this, case history starts by revealing that man, all mankind, and every individual man, collective man, and particular man is necessarily under the wrath of God. Is there anybody left out of that picture? No. Whole down to the individual. All covered by the same program. Part two, argument will set forth that degenerate man and unregenerated man are alike lost. That irreligious man and religious man are equally lost. This is why he could go to Mars Hill and have a conversation with people that believed in all those gods that were plastered all over heck and back because they all thought they were right. And again and again, you'll find why did Thessalonians come to, come to Christ? Because they had traveled that zealot line for all of their gods and got no return. And when he presented a God that gave them a act, an actual return of an internal peace that they could not achieve, they bought into it. Hook, line, sinker. Lock, stock, barrel. Any phrase you want to use, that's how they hooked up to it. And they became very well identified with it. They did not want to go back. And you will see times in Paul's life where he will make statements that you remember we went to this church, Timothy? All of those people have left us. So there were places where they walked away from Paul. But it might have been little windows of time. It might have been one of those times where you walked away and did some soul searching and came back. It doesn't tell you well all the rest of the information. So you have to pay attention to that too. Here's the deal. And then part two. These facts established and understood permit a universal prescription that can bring the divine remedy to all men. Okay? You lay out everybody's lost, you lay out everybody's hopeless, and then you can present a prescription to deal with the hopelessness and the lostness of everybody. Okay? That's why there was a little thingamajigger in the one of the books I was reading, and it was about a farmer. And he was farming across the street from a church. And he made it his point to farm every Sunday on that thing by running tractors and his harrows and his everything. And the whole time he was doing it, he would come back and go work all the rest of his farm during the week, but come back on Sundays and work that across from the church. And then he came after he was all done and had a tremendous harvest. And he went to the pastor of that church. He says, you know what? I want you to know this is the best piece of ground I have and it produced the most food that I have ever produced out of a piece of ground. What do you say about that as far as the fact that I wasn't in church? 
And the pastor just said one thing. He said, the God that I serve, he doesn't collect all debts at the end of October. So when his harvest season was over, and he thought he was so perfectly wonderful, the God that the people across the street were serving still took note of it. And we're going to cover it with the term wrath. You're going to see why we're talking this way. Because he understands all of these little nuances that everybody tries to wiggle and waggle around. All right. Well, telling that one of the things I found in my own personal studies of my personal finances mm -hmm. <clears throat> is that God's laws, His operational principles down here, work for lost and saved. Mm -hmm. uh, lost rich men can become billionaires. Oh, okay, yes. But that being said, there is a reckoning exemplified by the rich man on the edge of the sea who bemoaned his condition and came up with a solution and the spirit said that's too bad because at the end of today your soul is required. Okay, they require you. Yeah. But you have to understand eternity is a long time to think about I was the richest guy in the world and I'm in hell. That's a long thought process. Infinity? I'm not thinking that's just, you know, that's you end up not being the smartest guy in the room by the time you play that, that game. Now, I put this on the end. After this, I found it somewhere else. Case history of the race to the revelation of the remedy in Christ. God showing all classes under sin. This is what the book of the Revelation is. There's a compilation of everything they said in all the books prior to that showing that Righteousness is going to reign. There's not a thing you can do about it, even though you and I can walk around this world every day of the week and never see what we can possibly tell as a winning strategy anywhere. It does not appear that way to us. All right? That's why you can have people bomb France and kill people all over the place, and we just think, well, God is obviously not looking at this. Well, believe me, He is. And is exceedingly good at record keeping. Okay, that's why you don't want them keeping records on you. Your records are wiped clean in Christ, because you're going to pay all those records at the end of the show, and that's what people don't realize. Now, and here's the thing of it is: with all of this, we depend on God's perfection, which is why we did holiness and righteousness before we started studying this book. No, every aspect of Him is perfect. You realize how many people think God isn't perfect? Oodles of them. Okay? So if you can't grasp your little marble around that rascal, you're on a long, slow slope away from something. So, now, here's the last part. The touchstone of all judgment will be the attitude of men toward the truth of God as set forth in the Word of God. Not anybody's truth, but the truth of God. So your attitudinal program is what's going to help you get through the day. If you think you're downtrodden and depressed and ratty and rotty and all that kind of stuff, don't come around me. I don't want to see it. I don't want to hear it. I mean, I'll cut your legs out from under you. You're breathing, aren't you? You're walking on two legs. I'll take you and show you somebody that did Whole attitude could change. And that's the thing. The attitude has to be the part that you function in. Now, Okay, now here we go with this. Start here. First, we'll get to verse 18. It says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Alright? Now, first thing I need you to realize is, how many of you know what the word wrath means? Do you have any kind of fancy definition for it? Anger. Anger? Anything else? An intense form of it. But I also reckon an intense form of it. Intense right? form of but it? Okay. I also recognize that that right. word is an English word. Okay. And English is a living language and it changes, so it might not reflect what was meant originally when it was offered. Okay. All right. Well, that's probably exceedingly true. Because once you start scouting around a little bit, you find out that the Greeks put two words together for that little rascal. Okay? One of them 
since you've got it in your notes there, you'll see is this one, organic. That's the raft you've got on your paper. All right? Now, nine times out of ten, when people think of wrath when associated with God, they think of just boom, strike you, shoot you with a bolt of lightning, fry your little keister right there, drop the ashes to the ground, and go and blow you away. Sodom and Gomorrah. Yeah, there you go. That's a good one. Okay? They're still looking for that puppy. All right? But you need to realize that that's not exactly what it means. And here's the deal. Because here's the one that people really are, are speaking of when it comes to that kind of wrath. Thumus. And it has to do with panting rage. Okay? And from that means to breathe violently. How many of you got so mad that you hyperventilated? Happened? No? Okay, I just want to make sure I didn't. I was going to say, maybe you ought to sit back there and actually. No. Okay. So no, that's uh, the thing of it is, is that is a, a rage that comes on somebody that has been struck with something and really hits them wrong, and they just blow up at everything that's around them, and it just they're just in your face. Yes, ma'am. Doesn't that sort of have to do with temperament, though? Uh, somewhat. Yeah. I imagine that if you could get a, a phlegmatic to be thumus, you got to have a flipping Bunsen burner under their keister. I can't see him ever getting that fired up about something. Do me a favor. Relate or compare so that I can understand. Okay. Wrath is an emotion. Uh, well, okay, okay, you can say that except for it's talking about a wrath has to have Even the way you explain a it. concrete definition. An emotion you can't define. God says he has wrath, he's got a purpose for it. Okay? He has to go and deal with any kind of injustice, any kind of unrighteousness has to be dealt with in an organized fashion. So, he does not do this. He doesn't get red in the face and huffing and puffing. And matter, matter of fact, when I think of the God that they, that they speak of from Muslims, that's the one I think of. They're afraid of Him. They're afraid to talk to him. They're afraid to mention his name. They're afraid to make a cartoon about him. All of those things. So in other words, Allah is choleric. Pretty much. <laughs> well, it should put me in a bad standing. What I need is a progressive comparative. Okay. Uh -huh. Emotion. It, it, it's a progressive, progressing from okay. us through Here. Christ to God. Right. We look at that in an emotional way. So what exactly Hang on. is wrath with God the Father? Hang on. We'll but be right Christ right. is get human. It. Just so you know. So he has wrath. He has emotion. But the Father no. doesn't. Correct. So what constitutes wrath I'll tell with you an emotionless what. Father? It has to, be a, has to be a metered, perfect response to something that is offensive, not offensive, that is... Um, contrary to any of his essences. Okay, you go back in your notes and you look at all those essences. Alright? Omniscience, omnipresence, you know, all of those things, that is what he is. And anything that comes against that has got to be responded to in a righteous and just way that takes that out of the equation because he cannot entertain ever being in that type of environment. Okay, so now you know it is not an emotion. It is a response to a particular type of individual. All right, hey Bobby. Yeah, yeah, if, or yeah. if if you just kind of, I think of it this way: if you have like, say, a force field around mm -hmm. something, okay, and somebody's trying to penetrate that, they're working opposite mm -hmm. of what's right. that force field. And when you hit the force field, you feel the wrath of the force field, even though the force field has no emotion. Correct. You have the end result is you being repelled, being from. repelled back. Through. Correct. It is not because it the anything to do with what's inside. Had, the it did not get angry. Correct. It it was just that's the law that of that force. Field. Correct. And that, that works fine. Okay. Know, that's, that would be pretty good. All the, how do we get from there through the way it's exemplified in the Bible in such cases as, for instance, uh, his wrath in the temple, overthrowing the table, okay. or oh, wow. other in, other instances okay. oh, of an emotional nature. Yeah, we'll do that. But then you have to go. You have to, you have to separate from physical to deity. So, but go ahead. There, there, there's a 
a lot of examples in the Bible of God having emotion, and there's one right there. God is love it is the big emotion. Correct. So yeah, 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 yeah but we've already wrestled with that. It doesn't. It, it's that it doesn't penetrate. You, you cannot it. explain to me what love is. You cannot explain to me what love is. Okay. How about compassion? How All about, right. I mean. Love what is compassion? The other compassion is somebody God being somebody responding. I'm responding to somebody in my in my emotions, and I want to do something. Now, if I'm not supposed to do that, or if that individual is supposed to be left that way, what have I just done? Yeah, but we're talking about God's correct. Compassion, right? So here, let me do this this way. And here's the deal. Here's the one that we're dealing with in this one, and it'll help with what you're saying. All right, because this one here it signifies. A movement towards something. Alright? Now, it's going to be indignation that has gone, has, has risen gradually <laughs> to. Now, here's what I'm telling you. Here's what his. How many of you have flowers in your in your garden at home? How do your flowers start out? Buds. Buds. Nip it into bud. Nip. <laughs> yeah, that's what God does sometimes. <laughs> All right. So you got a bud, right? There's a little posy bud. All right. What do you got? What's in it? Do you know what's in it? A microcosm of minute microscopic engineering. Oh, I think there's flowers in mine. I'm not petals. sure. Petals. <laughs> That'll work okay. All right. Petals. But petals. There you go. Petals. All right. So, as things, as, as going with this little deal, all right, here's what's happening. God started something in the garden. Correct? It was perfect. Perfect. And then what happened to it? It got corrupted. So, how is he looking at it? is looking at it very casually. Did he, you ever, he, do you see anything in the garden that says he ever got angry with Adam and Eve? You see that anywhere? The thorns. You ever? <laughs> yeah. That was after the fact he made life tough. But was he angry with them? You don't hear him saying nasty things about them. He says, why are you hiding from me? He didn't say, come here, you little rug rat. Did he? No. And how, what did they do? They, they had something going on in their head, so they took off. But here's the deal. There was a package deal. Something is in this. And then when it gets to the end, what do you have? It opens up, and you end up having a flower and all this kind of stuff. So what has happened to it? It has been fed from inside, and God's doing something with this one right here. He is feeding it along the way. There is movement. He is becoming more and more indignant because of people's sin, because of their unrighteousness, which he categorizes in 1 John 1, 9. You're sinning and you do have unrighteousness. So he's going to keep on working with it. And it's rising and it's rising and it's rising. How many of you know what happens to a tomato when you water it too much? What happens to the fruit? Anybody know? What happens to it? It splits. It bursts. Okay? Same thing with a lot of different types of things. So what has happened? It is rising, and as it rises, it's gradually going to keep on getting to the point that it ends up bursting. And when it bursts, what happens? It is going to be settled. So as it got progressively worse through the Old Testament, it got more and more and more and more to where it had to burst. When it burst is when Christ decided that it was, here's my time. God says, go on down there. We've already gotten it to the point where it needs to be settled. So all these things are going on, but I still cannot be around anything unrighteous. Okay? Can't do it. So, he says, I'm going to respond to some of these situations. All through the Old Testament, see him responding to some of them. Good guys, old guys, up guys, down guys, big guys, little guys. Okay, why didn't he kill Nebuchadnezzar instead of just letting him go out and graze in the field for seven years? Well, to make an example out of him. He was a he was a necessary part of the program. So what did he do? He came back, 
became somebody that knew the God that, that was spoken of by Daniel and what goes on with all of these things. So things changed, but he still couldn't be around our righteousness. He couldn't do it. He can't be around us if we don't have Christ in us. He can't. Doesn't mean he doesn't care about you, but he can't interact with you. He can't mingle with you. He can't have anything to do with you. And that would be enough for you and I. How many of you, when you see a puppy dog hurt, or you see a turtle on the road, what do you generally do? You help them. Okay? It's emotional. Well, um, yeah, it is. But you have to understand, that's our package. I mean, I go around the turtle. I don't necessarily want to get out of my truck so some tree hugger comes along and runs over me because they think I'm doing something to the turtle. Right. I guess okay? what I'm trying to get to here is right. that if God the Father is pure righteousness. Correct. And pure Not if. Justice, he is. It is justice and righteousness. Right. That doesn't in itself contain elements that are translated by us into things like uh, compassion and caring. Those things are extra that don't seem to fit with nothing but pure righteousness and judgment. So therefore, how <coughs> do you attribute those to God who is right? But what if He is righteousness and judgment? How does he allow in certain things that would seem to be other than righteousness and judgment? Or caring about other things? If he cares about righteousness and judgment. Right there's the only reason. Then what part of himself is doing that? He's righteousness and judgment. I'm playing devil's advocate. This part of it, this Not part of it right I think here is doing. wrong, but because I think no. I don't understand. You have to understand. The guy that went to the cross, the guy that was imprinted. Imp impregnated with all the sins of the world, took every lick of, of consequence for all the sins of the world, is the guy that you now have indwelling you. So what does that tell God? As I look at you, 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 and you, I do not have to see, I, I can't, I will not see any of the stuff that's behind the curtain. He can't. Because the Christ is covering me. That's why I say it. You don't seem to realize you're putting on Christ. You're wrapping Him around. How many of you have jackets that when you close that puppy up and pull that string and you've got a little squeaky doodle of your eyeball sticking out? Is there anybody, in there, anybody that would not know you could come up to you and know who you are? No. There's not enough identifying and material sticking out there. Okay? So, you are now covered by Christ. Exactly like that. When God looks at you all the time, just like that picture you have on your refrigerator at home, with everybody having Christ's face in, on your face in that classroom, that is you all the time. For there to be this consideration and your descriptions would mean automatically that there has to be more to God the Father than truckloads, but you and I can't handle righteousness it. and justice. Well, there are. There are a whole bunch of other essences. But the two that react with you, what you and I contact God with, is justice. Because justice is the only thing that can mete out blessings. Omnipotence can't. Omniscience can't. Okay? None of the other things can. Only justice can mete out blessings. Righteousness allows it to happen. Justice applies it. If He looks at any part of you and He sees anything but Jesus Christ, you wouldn't even be on the chart. But He doesn't. Because Christ is perfect righteousness and perfect justice. He can't be anything but that. That's why I try to explain to people, Christ, the Gospel, when it talks about anything other than Christ, is a waste of words. Because you're not anything without Him. Nothing. I'm nothing. Every time my stinking mind starts getting messed up with Jesus' mind, do you realize how many side explosions there are? Because of what I happen to think and what He tells me is the truth. And the only reason that happens is because He's indwelling me and He's conducting His little program in me. And whenever my bad... How many of you... What happens when you corrupt the data putting into a computer? Garbage in, garbage out. <laughs> okay. All right. And that's exactly what you've got going on. He's continually putting this stuff in here. Prior to Christ, He annihilated. Looked at Noah. Yeah. I mean, Noah and Sodom and Gomorrah. Yeah. And you know, remember when he was standing on the hill with the prophet? And the prophet said, 
And the, and the little guy that was with the prophet said, Come on, we're going to get our butts kicked. There's like 180,000 people down there. They're going to run over us tomorrow. And then the guy, when the prophet went over and went, Come here, Ross. He goes, eh. Pulled that little curtain back. And he sees what's around the people that are at the foot of the valley. That's you. You are totally protected. Okay? The only time I'm not protected is when my card's punched and it's time for me to go home. I have tested that theory more times than you would like to think. Okay? Tons. And he says, nope, not ready for him. we got to get you out from under that hat, a hunk of car concrete that's going to fall. That stack of corrugated metal that's falling over that's going to crush you. Can't have that. Grab hold of that thing and I'm going to swing you out of the way. That gator's going to eat you. I'm sorry, he's not allowed to have you for lunch. i got things for you to do. You see what I'm saying? I can't. You can't destroy me. But I don't take that as, as pride. I take that as protection. Paul says, look, you guys have to understand the wrath is out there for everybody else. Your job is going to be to convey the good news so less people have to endure the wrath. That's all you're going to do. That's how you peddle Jesus. I mean, all you have to do with anybody is say, when was the last time you felt bad about something? And they go, well, you know, just the other day. I said, why did you feel bad about it? Well, they'll give you some bogus excuse or something. What it was is they let somebody down or, or whatever. I said, how would you like to never have that feeling again because of who's inside of you? Well, that can't be done. That's the first thing they say. Why do they say that? They're depending on themselves. <laughs> They're dependent on the body suit, the air suit that they got that's already let them down a hundred times. They already have a program in motion that says that. And Christ, he just doesn't do that. I told Kathy the other day, I need to find some way to put step stones out back from the house to the shed, to the chicken coop and to the shop. Because you know, there's a septic system right there. And if I ever need to pull it up and redo it, I don't want to have to dig up concrete and everything else. So I said, I need to find some bricks. Okay, I just need to find some bricks. And I'll just stack them on edge. And I'll put a couple of sticks on the side of them. And if I ever need it, I'll pull them up. So the other day, I was just walking across the street because the people were across the street were there and they were doing stuff with their house. And, and I went over and I said, you know, i, I got to figure out some way to find some old bricks. And they said, well, we got a whole bunch of them out back and we're not going to use them if you want them. That's not even 24 hours. You understand that? I like working for this guy. He has got a phenomenal program. All right? Phenomenal. And the thing about it is, with all of these things, I, all I can do is, that is the easiest way to conduct yourself in front of somebody that has never experienced Christ and His intervening program. You tell them what's going on in your life. And if you don't, then if you don't have anything to say, what does that tell you? Oops. Okay? You know, that's why they say, how do they know somebody's in, in, uh, in, a, in a battle? <clears throat> How do you know that? You watch that Oliver North thing with all the different wars he goes through. That's totally enjoyable. But the only way, you know how you know you're in combat? People are shooting at you. Pretty simple. You know, honest to God, it's not rocket science. If somebody's over there and he's poking shots at me, God checking in or what? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. All right, wait a minute. I think we got a verse for that. I just want you to understand that what he's telling these folks and what's, what he's being set up is, here's the other side of the coin. You're covered in righteousness. You're covered in justice. With a flip of a verse, he's going to lay out the, the program for all of those that do not adhere to the original program. Okay? And the fact that he has responses to people that are not righteous. He has responses to people that are sinful. Okay? So here's the deal. And it says... Yes, sir. You know, as you were just saying that, it, I harken back to a lecture that I went to from the guy who was at Benghazi, that was one of the authors of 13 Hours. Mm -hmm. And he was discussing how cool it was when the bullets start cracking over your head. 
they get excited. <laughs> They've been trained for their whole life for that. The bullets are going by <laughs> yeah. at, uh, supersonic speeds, and so you hear the the, the tiny uh, what do they call it? Thing? Sound barrier being broken. Yeah. Yeah. That thing. yeah. And the the bullets are going by, and that's when life gets exciting. Yo, yeah, yeah, I'm sure that's probably one of the times. <laughs> and yet, but the thing it is, is that's when you're in the battle, in the yeah. spiritual battle, you want to go and run and Yeah, fight. you want to go holy free, holy hope, you're not shooting at me. No, that's not how you're set up. But the fun part is to, to come through that battle and win. And I'm thinking, gee, you know what? I ought to get a little bit of his attitude. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't mind if they're shooting at you. The battle starts right. because you know you're headed for victory. You're exactly. not going toward victory. You're headed from victory. Yes, really. exactly. I've already got it wrapped up. And the thing of it is, is when you, you start putting that mindset put together, yeah, when you put that mindset together, you're you're a you're a force to be reckoned with, and Christ is exactly that force. And that's why it's so so much easier to tell somebody about Jesus Christ when you're in the middle of a battle. Okay. Yeah. And it's just it's it's just one of those scenarios. And it says, because it talks about something is revealed, okay? When it goes from the other things, unrighteousness is going to be revealed just like righteousness is revealed. How many of you consider yourself righteous? <laughs> and the only reason I consider myself righteous is because it's written in a book. Okay? And I have thoughts that are, that are appropriate for righteousness. But it's not from me. No, I know no, I, me. I obviously yeah, know that I, I can't have produce it, but it ain't correct. Me. I can't produce that righteousness. Right. Okay. That's why I have to be wholly dependent on the Holy Spirit of Jesus Christ just to make my day go to where people can stand to be around me. Okay. That's all there is to it. And the better I am in Christ, and the more I'm in Christ, and the more I entertain Christ, and more I might keep my mind on Christ, the easier it is for me to be that individual. All right. That's all you have to just put that little rascal aside. Now, it's revealed. This is all supernatural revelation. That's why you have to understand this. Paul is in Arabia when all of this stuff's revealed to him. Now he is going to reveal it to somebody else. But he's going to use the words that the Holy Spirit told him to use. This little statement right here, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven, Holy Spirit's writing that. Okay? That's not Paul saying, well, I've observed this. This is what's coming directly from the temple to say, look, I gave you the first side of this, and it also goes with this. Grace is always exhibited before wrath. Always. For every lost person, it is always a grace ex exhibition before wrath. Just so he never gets things out of order. All right? And it says, it's something that's being revealed. It's uh, away from or being hidden. So what is he going to talk about? He's going to talk about the church. He's going to talk about an indwelling spirit. He's going to talk about the power structure. He's going to talk about how he gets things done. He's going to tell how he communicates with God. All of these things are going to be revealed through Paul. Nobody else, just Paul. Because nobody else was given the, 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 the task of being the apostoli, the head apostle. Nobody. Alright? He has autonomy with God, and he is, but he is also totally directed by God. God puts him out there, he does his thing. If he makes a mistake, he goes back and does it again. Alright? That's how it's put together. It says for. This is a reason. Reason for the judgment of the unbeliever. Alright? Something is revealed so that now you know there are people out there that don't follow the plan. And it said the wrath, and that's why we did the orgay thing, is wrath or anger. This is response of God and utter abhorrence to sin. Okay? Justice and anger. These are, these are two sides of a coin. Alright? Divine judgment to be inflicted upon the wicked. Attic Greek, moral anger that protects from evil. This is the force field Donnie was talking about. Alright? My, my question always was, how could Satan be permitted in the temple to... to, to I, I, I can't find an answer to that. I don't know what the pro... I don't know whether he's in a little warp bubble so that there's no evil getting around out of him, only his voice. I, I don't know. But how can, he, how can God allow him to be in heaven when he is the epitome of evil? I, I don't... And the only thing I can say is, when you're out on bond, you're free. Am I correct? That's the only thing I can figure. 
we're in the appeals process and it hasn't terminated yet, so they haven't slapped the chains on the guy, so he's out on bond. That's the only thing I can figure. Well, we know he's going back. Well, yeah, but I mean, he's, but, but the thing is, he's, he's, he's yeah, he's, he's out, but his first, his first, his first incarceration was from the destruction of the world, from the planet we know, to the chaos. He lived in the chaos, all right? And the thing about this with that chaos is he could not see anything. It was totally dark. It wasn't, wasn't hot this time from what the scientists say. It was frozen. Okay? So he was, a, he was there for that. All of his buddies were there for that. So then they came out and came into their little unincarcerated time, which is walking planet Earth now, until he goes back to the one that's going to capture him for eternity, which one is going to be the lake of fire. One of the things I found out in reading the Bible is that many, many of the things, situations, or pictures that he's given to men, either through visions or just communicating with the people who wrote the Bible, are in overall highlighted form, in forms that we can understand. Yeah, they're highlight. symbolic. But he doesn't yeah. really he doesn't sure. really say it in the, the way and the method and the situation and reality that it's actually going on. Correct. Because that wouldn't, we wouldn't understand it because we haven't been there, he's Correct. there, but we would understand things that the way we see them in life. So he gives us those pictures and examples sure. that oh, we can understand. Just like how's, how's Daniel going to describe a helicopter? You know how he's going to describe it? Wheels with it. A dragonfly. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's so what with I'm two thinking. globes on the front, has a bunch of swirling, whirling things, and can move any which way it wants. Well, that's what I'm talking about. So, but the, the, yeah, but the thing is, that's why going to heaven to meeting with the sons of, of the people. correct. That's just a picture that we can understand. It doesn't correct. explain. We don't, the it doesn't of tell us the whole picture. Yes, yeah. exactly. But understand something. He's going to put enough information that you can function. Mm -hmm. Okay. You, you don't have to have the whole picture. Right. Um, when you're deer hunting, what do you look for? I look, and people say, well, you look for a deer. No, you look for parts of a deer. Okay? You never see them like they do on TV where they're standing out in the ever loving field brunts, I turn in their head like this. <laughs> okay? I mean, usually you see one foot, he's going like this. Or he might have one ear that's going like this. That's it. So that's the same thing with you. Look at the Bible, look at the parts and pieces. And take it to the Bible and find out what those parts and pieces are about. And that's what he's talking about here. He says, he says this is what has happened to me in the desert. All right? And it says, with all the wrath, with all of that, it says, of God, authorized source, judgment due to His holiness and justice. God's anger always exists against maladjustment to justice. Always. He cannot be around sin. Okay? Anyone not adjusted to the justice of God is on the outside looking in. You remember the movie The Shooter? Okay? You remember that senator on the snow top, snow capped mountain? He said, Are you on the out or the in? It's the exact same thing that's going on all the time with this. Same thing with your maturity in Christ. If you're a mature believer and you walk into heaven, you have access to seven different venues that are not available to somebody that is not stepping into heaven in a mature fashion. Come on in. Sorry we're late. We're fishing? We're fishing today. All right. <laughs> Sorry we're late. That's all right, boss. I, I just have a little boy that just uh, shouldn't be in here for long, so we're just going to... Not a problem. Listen, we'll be done here in a split second. Have a seat over here, boss, if you thanks want. We're going yeah. fishing in a little bit, That's guys. quite all right. You go wherever you need to go. <laughs> Is Jay Moore on here? Nah, not today. Normally, uh, yes. See, we were supposed to meet. Sorry for the following. Sometimes their schedule gets a little squirrely, too. So, when we're talking about all of that, you have to understand, with all of these things that are going on with this, you need to realize that your adjustment and what he's going on and what's going on has got to be done in his way. So, we can on from that, and it says it's out from, word from means it's out from the Supreme Court, the throne room, or the temple that's in heaven. And it says, against. Anybody unrighteous is automatically set up against God. You may not think that here, but not having Christ is opposite God. Alright? Those who hold truth, 
negative twisting the truth. So this is I'm out of time already. All right. Here's the deal. If you take truth and you twist it, okay, you are now in the crosshairs of the Holy Spirit and Jesus Christ, and they will straighten you out one way or the other. Here. Alright? Now you need to understand something. The reason that he leaves an individual that is spreading untruth about Scripture on planet Earth is to punish them here because he can't do it in eternity. You understand that? Why do you think he put David through the ringer so many times? Because flat out he tells you David is a man after God's own heart. But he ran that boy up the flagpole I don't know how many times because this is where he can do it. He cannot do it outside of time. Alright? Just understand that. We'll get more into it as we go through, but you need to pay attention to that. If you don't, I mean, if somebody has run out of options with the Lord, what does he do? He takes them home. Because they're not, testimony is, is so just destroyed that they're, there's no reason to leave them here anymore. He says, I'm sorry, I'm pulling you out. So just understand these things. They're, they're intricate little parts of the world that are a part of our lives, and we see this. That's why it always behooves you to spot a Christian that might be having a hard time and give them give them the help or give them the mentoring that they need to get back on the track. It's just something that is scripturally sound and it benefits the body because that individual has something that the body needs or he wouldn't even be in the body to begin with. Okay, Doug. I could see Myra, Melissa, Lisa, Jennifer, Ralph, and Ken. They're all on the cancer program. Church staff and service, military men and women, travelers. Allison should be coming back from Georgia this week. Holidays and coming up, people are going to be traveling. Just keep them all in your prayers. Um, I thank the Lord for the cool weather. We had one day that was 62. I'll take it. Uh, the people of France. Just keep them and the leadership of this nation, which is... They're going to wake up. Yeah. I didn't put that in there, but I figured you could fill in the blanks. And pray for Renee Edwards, a friend of Susan's. Renee is in Cape Canaveral Hospital for possible colon cancer surgery. And Reba, Jim's mother-in-law, with a pelvic bone. How she rehab? Is that the, the, the bakery people? Oh, her, Angela's mom. mom. Gotcha. I got I'm, I'm not a fan. There's the family tree people over there. Okay. I gotta. I gotta write it on the board or something. Tom and Edith Lamb, our first prospective buyer, and his lawyer decided to invest in other ways. Please continue to pray for the Lord's will regarding the building. Pray for salvation of close relatives. Lois, pray for Jim Weeble, former co-worker that has cancer. Keep Jim and his family in prayer. To joy, test to date all came back normal. Nice. I need to try to tell you you're normal. Everything's okay. The only thing is still doing a couple of All right, of that's all that. Well, echocardiogram. Okay, well, that's that's. That's the moment they put the soup on your side and go like this. No. Yeah, I think so. Okay. okay. Or jello or jelly or whatever. Okay. Yeah. Doctor trying to rule out everything and everything else. All right. Well, that's better than finding something. All right. Let's pray and I'll turn you loose. Just remember the 13th of December. Thank you, Lord, for today. We thank you for your word. Thank you for the way you put it together. Pray that we would understand it. Holy Spirit was certain it's certainly taken, sorted out, and put it in its proper place. And if there's any questions arise, allow them to come back next week and we'll deal with it as it comes. And that we give you all the honor and glory for the fact that we can study your word and that it makes a change in our lives. We ask these things all to take place in Christ's name. Amen.